Elder Haji Georges, the Athenite, who lived from 1809 to 1886. Published by the Holy Monastery of the Evangelist John the Theologian, Soroti Thessaloniki, Greece. Written by St. Paisios of Manathos. Prefatory Note With God's help, we have completed the publication of the book Elder Haji Georges the Athenite by Elder Paisios of Blessed Memory in response to the desire of many English-speaking Orthodox to have the elders' books in their mother tongue. Feeling the responsibility as well as the obligation toward the elder, who feared that his words might be altered through translations and do harm rather than good, we delayed this publication, hoping and striving for the most faithful rendition of the original as possible. We warmly thank those who helped us in our effort, and especially Dr. Michael Christakis, who, out of love and reverence toward the elder, willingly worked together with the nuns of the monastery until the translation took on its final form. May the good God, through the intercessions of the elder Haji Georges and the elder Paisios, grant his blessings abundantly to all and fulfill all requests to their salvation. Signed, the Holy Monastery of the Evangelist John the Theologian, June 19, 1996. Memory of St. Paisios the Great. Preface It is customary in the ecclesiastical tradition and in the tradition of collecting the lives of saints that monks who have learned and lived as disciples near holy elders would write down their lives, their teachings, and their miracles. In this way, most of the texts of the lives of the saints have been handed down to us as treasures. Indeed, when it happens that these elders have been slandered and misunderstood in this life, this presents an urgent need and sacred obligation for their descendants. Father Paisios was not a disciple of Haji Georges, nor even a disciple of his disciples, since he lived in a much later era. However, as a young monk searching to find holy elders, the fragrant flowers of the Panagia, as he himself notes, he heard the Athenite monks in the early 1950s speak with special devotion and admiration about the ascetic struggles of the elder Haji Georges, who had lived in the previous century. Nevertheless, those of us who knew Father Paisios do not find it difficult to maintain that he was a spiritual descendant of Haji Georges, not only in the broader meaning as an Athenite monk, but also in the narrower meaning, especially as a struggler, ascetic, and faster. He was a monk who until our days preserved the measure and the ascetic rule of Haji Georges. Their way of life was parallel and comparable. There were many common elements in both of their lives. They both left their homeland at a young age. They left their parents out of love for Christ. They took their love out of their small family, and in this way they acquired divine love, thereby considering all people their brothers. They became children of the great family of God, and they saw in the face of every man all of Adam, all of mankind. They did not have plans of their own, and that is why God put them in his divine plan. Because they had recognized the great value of the angelic habit and the sweetness of the genuine monastic life, they did not wish for other honors. They endeavored to be hidden and remain in obscurity, but God revealed them to men. They both received the gifts of the grace of God profusely, the relationship with nature, and friendship with wild beasts as it was prior to the fall. The one came to an understanding with and showed hospitality to wild boars, and the other to vipers and lizards. The gift of spiritual perception, most apparent in both, functioned as a spiritual television. Also the gift of healing the sick was also abundant in both. They did not use these to project themselves but rather to support and console those who were suffering and despairing and to help them find the path of salvation. Their renown, while still in this life, reached beyond the borders of Manathos and Greece. People flocked to them from everywhere in order to be close to them so as to benefit spiritually. From morning until evening, they gathered up the pain of the suffering people, warming their hearts with their spiritual love, which was like spring sunshine. For this reason, the hearts of men who were near them opened, and they became 
recipients of the mercy of God. They practiced the cutting off of the will and the patristic spirit. In other words, they pruned the passions with discernment and did not hack away indiscriminately. Because they had true sanctity, people were obedient to them out of devotion and not out of fear. Both offered themselves as a sacrifice to God through asceticism out of philotimo, and they served people out of unselfish love. Rarely did they rest in bed. Rest for them meant standing in prayer in the stasidi, the church seats. There they rejoiced in long all-night vigils and were spiritually nourished. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God. Psalm 83.10 Their cell rarely hosted them because at night they were in church and during the day they were with suffering people. Those who lived close to Father Paisios, even during the final period of his life, after his operation, can confirm the truth of these words. Almsgiving was the other great characteristic of both of them. Father Paisios not only fasted like Haji Georges, but also gave like Haji Georges. What is a merciful heart? A heart burning for all creation, says St. Isaac the Syrian, whom the elder had as a daily spiritual delight. He kept the Haji Georgian rule of giving as a blessing those things which others gave to him, while he remained always materially poorer than the poor. He sent bags of food brought to him by others to inv inv invalid and bedridden monastic elders of the skeet of Kutlumusiu and to other Kilia, saying, what am I going to do with these? Are we going to open a supermarket? I did not come here for summer vacation. Give them to that poor elder who has need of them. In the additional section at the end of the book, the adventures and trials of Haji Georges provide an opportunity for Father Paisios to help every suffering and unjustly treated person so that he may correctly access the afflictions that other people cause him and be able to rejoice in these trials. This rising above afflictions, as illustrated by the elder, is completely biblical and patristic. He emphasizes that those who are unjustly treated are the most beloved children of God, and that they can rejoice and exult together with Christ, who was treated unjustly. However, his great discernment and love endeavors not only to approach and help those who strive to interpret the afflictions and trials of the righteous, but also to lead to repentance those who harm and do wrong to others. Only such a patristic approach, pastoral approach, coming from a heart so much on fire with love, does not treat the unrighteous and sinners with contempt and arranges things so that no weak soul be lost. Now the body of Father Paisios, worn out by asceticism, rests according to his wish in the courtyard of the Holy Monastery of St. John the Theologian in Soroti, in the domain and embrace of his saint, the blessed and holy Arsenios of Cappadocia. While his holy soul rejoices and exalts together with those in the courts of his Lord, in the upper realm of the angels, which he longed for during all of his life. From there he intercedes for us. He is now together with blessed Arsenios, the elder Haji Georges, and the other Athenite fathers, who with admirable success imprinted their lives not only in his books but also in his life. It is not easy to say which of these two imprints is most accurate. In any case, rarely do we come across such an astonishing similarity and identification of the author with the object of his work, the biographer with the biography. Father Paisios' struggle for the preservation of authenticity and genuineness of the spirit and life of the monks of the Holy Mountain and of monasticism in general, as well as his love for all the people, for the large family of Adam, the church, created the aforementioned double miracle. His simple grave, which holds his grace-filled body, supports the people in their struggle, their pain, and their trials. It pours forth miracles and is a spring of healing but also the eminently delightful books which he left us, patristically and existentially, and in a way understandable to all, guide us on the way of orthodox spiritual life, helping the reader 
find the path of salvation. Father Paisios and his works today concern and interest universal orthodoxy. From that viewpoint, the response of the Holy Monastery of St. John the Theologian to the request of many of our Orthodox brothers to translate his works into other languages so that other people may benefit is exceptionally praiseworthy. Together with the opportunity provided by this translation, these lines were also written as a humble memorial to the elder and with thankful gratitude for all his love and prayers. Signed, Professor Anestis Kesselopoulos, Thessaloniki, 26 September 1995, the translation of St. John the Theologian. Prologue. Descendants always have a sacred duty to write down the divine achievements of the Holy Fathers of their times and the struggle they undertook out of Philotimo in order to draw closer to God. Footnote Philotimo, according to Elder Paisios, is the reverent distillation of goodness, the love shown by humble people from which every trace of self has been filtered out. Their hearts are full of gratitude toward God and to their fellow men, and out of spiritual sensitivity they try to repay the slightest good which others do to them. To continue, naturally by writing about our saints, we too benefit, because in this way we remember and try to imitate them. Then the saints are moved even more to help us draw closer to them. Therefore, if we must speak and write about the virtues of these righteous souls, our holy fathers, how much more should we not neglect or be silent about the souls of our just but unjustly treated holy fathers, whom we, wretched people that we are, have tormented with persecutions and exiles out of our own human weaknesses, jealousies, and envy. Yet if the unrighteous repent sincerely, they too are saved, while the unjustly treated are not only saved but rewarded as well, and are the most beloved of God's children. The Lord loveth the righteous, Psalm 146, 8. Holy Scripture continually praises the souls of the righteous, and the prayers of the righteous are heard. The prayers of a righteous man has great power in its effects, James 5:16. Therefore, among the unjustly treated fathers of our church is also the most blessed Father George, Haji Georges, footnote Haji, honorary title analogous to the Islamic Hats, which means pilgrim. It is also given to Orthodox pilgrims of the Holy Land who are, quote, baptized by entering into the Jordan River in a symbolic remembrance of the baptism of Christ. For the Orthodox pilgrim, the title Haji consists of an inseparable constituent placed before their baptismal name. To continue. He is also the most blessed father, George Haji George, a contemporary saint of our times. We can also say that, considering our era, he is a great saint indeed. By a spiritual way of life, the elder left behind him a great reputation. A great ascetic and strict faster, people would say. His name is even used as a nickname for those who were strict fasters. He is a Haji Georges, they would say. When I first came to the holy mountain and wandered about the garden of the Panagia, as most beginners usually do, in order to seek out the most fragrant flowers of the Panagia, the holy elders, so as to gather up a little spiritual pollen, I would hear everyone talking with great reverence and admiration about Haji Georges. The many things I heard about him prompted me to revere him even more and become more interested in him. That is why I contacted his grandchildren, that is, the spiritual children of his disciples, as well as his compatriots from Cappadocia, such as Father Stephanos from the Holy Monastery of Esvigimenu, Elder Basil from Karakalu, Father Seraphim, the icon painter, and others from near where Haji Georges had lived. Footnote, the Garden of the Panagia. According to holy tradition, the Panagia, together with the evangelist John, was forced by a storm to disembark on the holy mountain during a trip. Its inhabitants were still idolaters, and the Panagia asked Christ to give it to her as a gift. The answer came with a heavenly voice. This place is your inheritance and your garden and paradise. It is also a harbor of salvation for those who wish to be saved. Since then, the holy mountain is considered 
as a spiritual garden or orchard under the supervision of the Panagia. To continue, all that I learned about him I noted in my memory so that I might be benefited and now it has become necessary for me to write down in a notebook so that some other soul may benefit as well. I also discovered many other facts about devout Russians who had written not only about Haji Georges, but also about his elder and even about his spiritual grandfather, the elder Alexentios. The Russian Hezekiah's father, Antony, from Karulia also provided many facts. Of course, however much one writes will not be enough about the great Haji Georges. May we have his blessing. Amin. The life of our blessed father George, Haji Georges. Our most blessed father George was born in Kermira, of Kesaria in Cappadocia in 1809. His parents were rich not only in virtues, but also in material blessings from God, which they distributed among the poor wholeheartedly. His father's name was Jordan, and he was from Kermira, and his mother's name was Maria, and she was from Galveri. After having two children, Gabriel, Haji Georges, and Anastasios, they then lived more spiritually and lovingly as brother and sister. They lived in abstinence. From childhood, his mother, Maria, was ascetical because she had a sister who was a nun, an ascetic, whom she visited later with her children. As young Gabriel listened to the various stories of his aunt about ascetics, a desire was kindled within his tender heart to become a monk, and so he attempted to imitate the ascetics with strict fasting and prayer. His father, Jordan, was also devout, and being involved in commerce, spent most of his time traveling. Naturally, this gave Maria the opportunity to lead a simple life and not to be anxious and troubled about many things, Luke 10.41, and to take young Gabriel with her, because he was more devout than his brother, to keep all-night vigils with other women, sometimes in caves, other times in remote chapels. Thus we can say that the milk of this blessed mother on which Gabriel was nursed was ascetical. When Gabriel grew up, he went to school, but could not learn to read and write, even though he was very smart. It seems that this affliction was God's providence, so that this sanctified child would learn his letters, his words, in a divine way. For four whole years, little Gabriel struggled at school and was not able to articulate his words. Because his parents and his teachers were always scolding him, he sought opportunities to leave for the caves. There in Kermia and Kermil was the cave with the bodily imprint of St. George the Great Martyr. Footnote, according to holy tradition, St. George lay down in the cave and there remained some imprints of his body. And it was here where little Gabriel went most often. He fasted and he prayed a great deal, making many deep prostrations. And when he felt exhausted, he would eat the wild greens that grew on the mountain. Often he was absent for a month. He had come into contact with ascetics who lived in nearby caves, and he too lived ascetically in a cave near them. His parents later found him out and from then on did not scold him for not being able to learn to read and write. One day his mother kindly told him, Gabriel, my child, go to church and ask the Panagia to help you to learn to read and write. There was a miracle-working icon of the Theotokos in their parish church. Little Gabriel, after keeping a three-day fast and making many deep prostrations for hours on end, set out at night for church in order to pray so that others would not see him. As soon as he arrived in the narthex, he fell down at the threshold of the church, and with reverence and tears he worshipped from outside because the door to the nave was closed. While he was supplicating Panagia, grant me, Queen of Heaven, to learn to read and write. The doors of the church suddenly opened. The Theotokos appeared. And taking the child by the hand, she brought him to the icon of Christ and said, my son, grant that little Gabriel may learn to read and write. And as he himself later said, With these words she blessed me with her hand. 
she embraced me and said, Now you have learned to read and write. Then she entered the sanctuary by the north door. Realizing that she was not coming out, Gabriel went in. He looked throughout the church but could not find her. Later, when it was time for the divine service to begin, the sacristan came to ring the bells and saw the doors open and Gabriel inside the church. Thinking he lost his senses, he asked in amazement, How did you get inside? Gabriel told him in detail what had happened. To verify the truth, the sacristan gave him a book to read, and Gabriel read it beautifully and clearly. Then the sacristan told him, Truly, that woman was the Panagia. After that divine occurrence, whereby little Gabriel learned to read and write in a miraculous manner, his parents and all his relatives held him in reverence. But Gabriel continued going to the caves to struggle ascetically. In fact, he gathered some friends and they built a small monastery with a church and some cells, small cells, and had Gabriel as their abbot. At the age of 14, he followed his relatives to Constantinople because they had learned that his uncle who lived there had converted to Islam. As they were passing through a desolate area, he thought that he might find some hermits there whom he could ask to pray for his uncle. So he left his companions and searched the forest, but did not find any hermits. But now he had also lost his companions, and in distress he called upon St. George to help him. Suddenly the saint appeared to him in an officer's uniform with a radiant face, and said, Have you really lost your way, Gabriel? Yes, I'm lost, replied the youth. Come with me. St. George said, and lifted him on his horse. At once he reached his companions, who marveled, glorified God. As soon as they arrived in Constantinople, he, along with his relatives, with much heartache, visited his uncle. His uncle held an important position in the court of Sultan Mahmud II, who lived from 1808 to 1839. Once, because he had ordered various projects to be carried out in his homeland, the Armenians became envious of him and slandered him to the Turks. Unfortunately, to avoid the death which awaited him, he became Muslim. As a result, the Sultan had greater trust in him than previously. Whereas the others left to return to their homeland after they had urged the uncle to repent, Gabriel stayed in Constantinople close to him and prayed a great deal. He struggled very rigorously to persuade not only his uncle to return to Christianity, but also a priest and several others who had also become Muslims out of fear. Gabriel's fervent prayers together with his fasts and his many deep prostrations prompted divine intervention, and they became at first secret Christians and later departed for Smyrna. His uncle became a church sacristan, and struggled with a great sense of philotimo and repentance. He fell asleep on the bright day of the resurrection. The priest, together with the others, also struggled with philotimo and contrition, and in repentance fell asleep in the Lord as Christians in Smyrna. During the four-year period that Gabriel stayed in the sultan's court, the sultan became aware of his ascetic life and marveled at it, Quote, here's a young man who is totally unaffected by human praise and worldly pleasures. He sleeps in a dark cellar and eats a handful of soaked barley only once a day. He prays all night and continuously makes prostrations for hours. The sultan wondered at all this and said to his courtiers, Who taught this young man to fast and pray like that? The holy life of young Gabriel had changed even the sultan himself, who also became a secret Christian. Gabriel, who was later known as Haji Georges, would say the following, After this, Sultan Mahmud loved the Christians. Previously, the Christians were not allowed to repair any ruined churches or build the new ones. Afterwards, he issued about 2,000 permits for the constructions of new churches and so forth. The Sultan even donated two large icons, one of St. John the Forerunner, whom he greatly venerated, 
and the other of St. John's father, the prophet Zacharias, as well as a silver chandelier. In addition, he showed great favor and goodwill toward the patriarch of Jerusalem, which owed 36,000 gold pounds to the Jews. The sultan demanded all the documents connected with this debt, destroyed them, and then strictly ordered the Jews to cease demanding this debt from the patriarchate of Jerusalem. He also changed many other Turkish customs and helped Christians a great deal. It was only natural that the Turks would kill him and publicly say that he had died a natural death. So Gabriel, at the age of 18, and after his four-year stay in Constantinople, and the return of others to Christianity, became more intensely concerned with his own salvation. With tears, he constantly implored Panagia, day and night, to take him away from the sultan's court and show him the way to salvation. Once, during the divine liturgy, at the church of the Patriarchate, while he stood before the icon of the Theotokos, which is behind the mosaic patriarchal throne, he begged tearfully the Panagia to guide him, when the divine liturgy ended, he did not go outside with the others, but continued to beseech the Panagia with great faith and childlike simplicity to inform him what he should do. For a moment, as he later related the story, he saw the Queen of Heaven dressed in a brilliant white garment coming out of the icon, approaching and asking him, What do you want? I want to be saved, Gabriel answered. The Theotokos said to him, Go to the outer gate of the Fanar. Footnote, the neighborhood of Constantinople on the southwestern side of the Golden Horn Bay. Following the fall of Constantinople, the ecumenical patriarchate, after many relocations about the city, was established at the Fanar in 1600 AD. Today it is identified with the ecumenical patriarchate. To continue, go to the outer gate of the Fanar, to the pier, where you will see a monk. Go with him to the holy mountain. After the Panagia had said this, she re-entered her icon. Gabriel then ran with great joy to the pier, where he saw a thin, venerable monk with a long white beard. He was the abbot of the monastery of Grigoriu on the holy mountain, and his name was Gregory. Gabriel fell at his feet and implored the monk to let him go with him to Athos. But the Athenite abbot told him, According to the Holy Fathers and the provisions of the patriarchs, we are prohibited from taking not only children like you, but also those who do not yet have a beard. That's just the way it is. So don't fight it. You can't come to Athos for now. When Gabriel heard his refusal, he was very hurt, and was forced to relate how he had seen the Panagia, and that it was she who told him to tell the abbot to take him to Athos. Unfortunately, however, the elder would in no way agree to take him to the holy mountain, nor did he pay any attention to the request of the Lady Theotokos, who was able to act against human rules, as good as they might seem. All this took place in the presence of the captain of the boat, who sympathized with Gabriel, and told him, My child, come into the boat secretly, and show yourself to the elder when we arrive at Athos. Gabriel left Constantinople in 1828, and after a few days the boat arrived at the monastery of Grigoriu. Gabriel got off the boat and fell at the feet of the abbot and said, The Panagia has brought me to the holy mountain. And tears streamed from his eyes, Still, however, the abbot did not want to take him to the monastery. He even avoided looking at him. But the fathers of the monastery convinced the abbot, and he accepted Gabriel. Immediately they assigned him to the obedience of kitchen helper, and he served this task willingly and struggled with Philotimo in the spiritual life. Gabriel was still a novice when the monastery celebrated the feast of its patron saint, St. Nicholas. But due to bad weather, they were unable to fish. The fathers were worried that they would not have fish to offer to the feast day pilgrims. Gabriel, however, was not upset about this, because he considered it a very special matter for St. Nicholas to solve. Thus he entreated St. Nicholas and a bunch of large 
fine fish were miraculously thrown onto the pier of the monastery on the eve of the feast. With joy the brothers brought them up to the monastery and they prepared them, glorifying God. After this divine occurrence, Gabriel left for Kafsok Olivia, so as not to be honored by the fathers of the monastery. He had stayed at the monastery of Griryu for about two months. While he was there, he had learned of an experienced spiritual father at this gate of Kafsok Kalivia, a father Neophytos Paramanlis, a compatriot of his, a man of great force and full of the grace of God. He therefore went to Kafsok Kalivia, where he found Father Neophytos at the, the huts of St. George. These huts, a simple monastic dwelling which has a chapel within it and a very small area around it, Many together formed this gate. To continue, as soon as Father Neophyto saw young Gabriel, he received him with joy because he discerned the grace of God depicted on the face of this young man. However, since there was a large Turkish army unit, even on the holy mountain at that time, due to the Greek revolution of 1821 to 1830, Father Neophytos let Gabriel stay in the cave of blessed Nephon, where he himself struggled ascetically for the greater part of his life, in order to protect the young man from the barbaric Turks. There in the cave, Gabriel struggled rigorously with Philotimo for four years, without seeing anyone except his elder, who visited him and gave him the most pure mysteries. When Gabriel reached maturity, the number of Turkish troops had been somewhat reduced. So he returned to the skeet near his beloved elder, Father Neophytos, in the huts of St. George, where nine other spiritual brothers lived. Although he was still a novice, Gabriel, he showed signs of being a mature monk. He was, in other words, a radio operator of God. St. Paisios frequently used military terms, adapting them to the spiritual life, and because the elder served as a radio operator, St. Paisios, during his military service, by analogy, he also called monks radio operators of the church because they are in frequent communication with God through their unceasing prayer, helping themselves and all the world in those matters that are being humanly impossible, only possible by God's intervention. To continue, once while he was praying, he heard the voice of his elder telling them, my dear monks, save me. He ran immediately, told his oldest spiritual brother, who unfortunately scolded him. Be gone, deceived one, and do your canona, your rule of personal prayer, hearing the voice of the elder. Gabriel obeyed, went back to his cell. However, as soon as he began his prayer, he heard his elder again more intensely, and with a heart-rendering voice crying out, My dear monks, save me. I am near the cross at the Zygos before Kerasia, and I am in danger. Help me. Again, Gabriel went to his spiritual brother and told him, Our Yerond is in danger. He is high up at the cross. This time, however, he scolded him even more. You are really so deceived. You can hear the voice of the elder from the cross. That is a distance of about two hours by foot in good weather. Then Gabriel in anguish begged him, My father, say the Jesus prayer with your prayer rope, crossing yourself, and pay attention, and you'll see. As soon as he started to make the sign of the cross, one or two times, and say the Jesus prayer, he heard the heart-rendering voice of their elder. Immediately, they tied sticks and cords around their feet so that they would not sink into the snow, and they set off. Because of the heavy snow, it took them about half a day to climb to the point to where the elder was. If there was one meter of snow down in Kavsokolivia, how much more would there be high up at the cross? As Father Neophytos was returning from a journey during bad weather in midwinter, climbing up from the skeet of St. Anne, toward Kerasia near the cross was overcome by exhaustion, and since the snow was as deep as the height of a man, the elder sank into it and could not get out. 
When his monks arrived, they found him near death, buried in the snow. He was frozen as a board, and they took him immediately first to Caracia so that he could recover. But the thought occurs to me that what saved the elder was not the warmth and warm drinks that they offered him in the form of human care, but rather the fervent prayer of Gabriel. When Father Neophytos became well, they descended to Caso Calivia, to the huts of St. George, and shortly thereafter Gabriel was tonsured a monk, and was given his monastic name, George. Later, after his pilgrimage to the Holy Land, he took the name of Haji Georges. Because the brotherhood of Father Neophytos at Caso Calivia had increased in number, they moved higher to Caracia, so that they would have more room and quiet. Initially, they stayed for four years at the hut of the Holy Apostles. Uh, this, this hut, the Kili, the cell, a self-sufficient dwelling with a chapel within and surrounding a wide area. It's dependent on a monastery, does not belong to a skeet, and they're bigger than the huts, the Kili. The cell of the Holy Apostles, until they prepared the large Kili of St. Demetrius and St. Menas, where the entire brotherhood could be accommodated. There at Caracia, Father Neophytus had seen a vision and established a strict typicon, the set of rules and rubrics regarding the divine services, the rules of the monastery re regulating the monk's life in general and so forth. There, Father Neophytos had seen a vision and established the strict typicon with continuous fasting and unceasing prayer. Afterwards, in 1848, he left Father George, Haji Georges, to be the elder, and took a Kali in Caries belonging to the monastery of Simonopetra, dedicated to St. Nicholas, so as to make it easier for pilgrims and as well for himself to help more troubled souls, charismatic spiritual father that he was. The fathers of his brotherhood at Caracia felt great spiritual security with Haji Georges as well, because he had been a disciple and thus understood discipleship. He applied the cutting off of the will in the patristic sense, that is, the cutting off of childish egotism at times, and at other times, the controlling of enthusiasm. In other words, he pruned with discernment and did not hack away indiscriminately. Because of the elder was holy, his monks were obedient out of reverence and not out of fear. He was very hard on himself and continually increased his asceticism. The elder said, when one involves himself with fasting, with all-night vigils and prayer, bodily powers are exhausted, and the flesh moans and complains about the difficulty and the labor of the ascetic life. This is when one must be particularly careful in the battle against the thoughts, so as not to be hindered on the path of salvation and thus lose his soul. For this is when the days of worldly life are brought back to the memory. After so many years of such struggles, it was only natural that he became exhausted and also that he had become incorporal. Although his legs hurt him due to the long hours spent standing during prayer, and especially his knees from the many prostrations, and in general his entire body from asceticism, the elder continued his strict rule and never took any medication. He would tell his disciples and visitors the best medicine is the frequent reception of the most pure mysteries of Christ. Frequent confession and Holy Communion are the most important and necessary requirements for earthly spiritual exaltation and heavenly joy. He also told them the following story. A hermit once asked the devil, What are the most fearful things that happen in your life? The devil answered, there are terrible and unbearable things that happen to us. What are they? The elder asked. Here is what they are. The mystery of baptism through which we completely lose our authority and rights over you. The cross which torments us, drives us away and destroys us. And especially Holy Communion. Communion, continued the devil, is more fearful for us than the fire of Gehenna. Not only can we not approach he who worthily receives Holy Communion, but we are even fearful to look him in the face. 
However, as deadly as these things are for us, we are grateful to people who, by their carelessness and sinful habits, of their own accord distance themselves from the power of the mysteries. In this way, again, by their own accord, they give us the right to have dominion over their hearts. Through this story, Haji Georges would make them understand more vividly how important the holy mysteries are for Christians. For himself, the elder would recall the following story, which his elder father Neophytos had told him when he would endure with joy the trials and pains of asceticism for the salvation of his soul. Once a man who was ill lost his patience and cried out to the Lord asking to be relieved from his terrible pains. An angel then appeared and told him, quote, The all-merciful God has heard your prayer and will grant your petition, but under one condition. Instead of one year with torments on earth, by which every man is cleansed from sin like gold in fire, you will agree to spend three hours in hell. Because your soul needs to be cleansed with the trials of illness, normally you would have to endure sickness for another year. Since this seems difficult for you, think of what hell means where all sinners go. For this reason, try if you wish for three hours only, and then with the prayers of the Holy Church, you will be saved. The sick man, he thought, one year of torments on earth is a very long time. It is better to be patient for three, year, three hours than for one year. I agree to three hours in hell, he told the angel. The angel then gently took the man's soul in his hands, left it in hell, and withdrew, saying, I will return in three hours. The everlasting darkness which reigned, the oppression the cries of the damned which reached his ears, and their wild appearance all created terrible fear and sorrow in the unfortunate man. He beheld and heard torments everywhere. In this immense abyss of hell there was no sound of joy to be heard. Only the fiery eyes of demons could be seen in the darkness, waiting to tear him apart. Well, the wretched man began to tremble and cry aloud, but only the abyss answered his cries and screams. It seemed to him that entire ages of torments had passed, and while he expected the angel to come at any moment, this did not happen. Finally, despairing that he would not see paradise, he began to moan and cry, but no one cared. The sinners in hell only thought about themselves, and the demons rejoiced in their torments. But behold, the sweet radiance of the angel appeared in the abyss. With an angelic smile, he stood over the tormented man and asked him, So, how are you faring, O man? I would not believe that there could be deceit of even among angels, the tormented man whispered. Well, what do you mean by that? asked the angel. What do you mean by what do I mean? continued the tormented man. You promised me that you would take me from here after three hours. And since then, years, rather whole centuries, have passed with unbearable torments. Oh, blessed man, what years, what ages, the surprised angel said. Only one hour has passed since I left, and you must stay here another two hours. What? Two hours? Oh, I cannot bear it. I do not have the strength. If it is possible, and if it is the will of God, I beseech you, take me from here. It would be better to suffer for years on earth until the day of judgment. Just take me out of hell. Have pity on me, the tormented man cried out, raising his hands to the angel. Very well, replied the angel. The good God, as loving Father, will have mercy on you. With these words, he opened his eyes and saw that as before he was in his bed of illness. With such thoughts the elder mortified all his senses, because interest in the salvation of one's soul humbles the flesh and deadens the passions. 
After such supernatural asceticism and from such patience and perseverance while going through such terrible pains, and because of his humble thoughts, which brought him to believe that he was very sinful and that he had, he had to cleanse his soul through the pains of illness, even though he was sanctified from his mother's womb, it was natural that an abundance of the grace of God was granted him so that he never became ill during his entire life. Father George would become very sad when someone during his first steps of monastic life would lose courage and be shaken as soon as he started the struggle for the salvation of his soul. Unable to endure the struggle, he would succumb to temptation and abandon the monastic schema and holy athos without sensing the gravity of his promises to God. He used to say that we must accept every trial and sorrow that God sends us with humility and patience so that our soul may be cleansed completely from our sins, committed with knowledge or in ignorance. Those whom the elder saw had given in to Akedia, a passion the, which the monk must struggle against. It means laziness, indifference, torpor for the spiritual life. St. Nilos says, Echidia is dejection of the soul. In the West, despondency and depression and the like. He consoled and advised spiritually. And for those who did not want to bear the cross of the monastic life and wanted to abandon the holy mountain, the elder related the following story. An Athenite monk who had the gift of spiritual insight saw all the hordes of demons, each one more loathsome than the next. Among them all, however, one appeared so loathsome that one felt disgust just by looking at him. The ascetic looked at him and wondered how his terrible ugliness came to be. Why do you look so at us so strangely, monk? That demon asked with a satanic irony. All these that you see are the demons who tempt monks, and by every means try to hinder them in their salvation, causing Akedia by their, the thought of their relatives in the homeland, and by placing tempting thoughts in them to leave the holy mountain and return to the world. Well, it's my job to carry on my shoulders and take to the boat those who leave from the holy mountain and throw off their monastic habit. And... It is they who have disfigured my neck and my back. And once I've carried them to the boat, I travel together with them into the world. The elder crossed himself and everything disappeared. Haji Jordis advised each person accordingly with discernment, consoling their souls and helping them with his heartfelt prayer. His face was radiant because of his holy life, and he radiated divine grace to afflicted souls. The holy elders' fame had reached everywhere, and people flocked from all around to be spiritually benefited. From morning until night, he took the pain of the afflicted upon himself, and he warmed their hearts with his spiritual love, which was like spring sunshine. A good day appears from the morning. He left his country as a child. He left his parents for the love of Christ. He withdrew his love from his small family and procured divine love. And thus felt as though everyone in the world were his brothers and sisters, so he became a child of the great family of Adam, of God. He did not have plans of his own, and for this reason God placed him in his divine plan. He made him a spiritual father. Because he recognized the great value of the angelic schema, he did not dare other honors. Footnote on angelic schema. The monk is called to imitate the angels and be similar to them in purity. That is why the monastic state is called the angelic schema. Angels are light to the monastics. The monastics are light to the lay people. To continue. He did not desire any other honors. Many wanted to become his disciples, and especially underage children who were not received in the monasteries. But Haji Georges felt sorry for them, received them from the age of 15, protecting them not only as an affectionate father, but also as a good mother. 
to make them happy with the thought that they also had beards, he would smear their faces with soot. Even though there were many young children in his brotherhood, they not only did not create difficulties for Haji Georges's strict rule of asceticism, but rather the young ones surpassed the older ones in their asceticism. In all, there were 30 brothers. They had as many as 50 at the cell of St. Demetrios and St. Manas. In his brotherhood, there were always six or seven youths from monasteries or from other brotherhoods until they grew their real beards and spiritual wings near the Holy Elder. Because the spiritual atmosphere of Haji George's was very warmly imbued with the grace of God, the fathers being kindled spiritually naturally did not need much of material food and with calories. Their usual food was nuts, dried fruit, and honey. They never ate meat, never eggs, or nor milk, butter, nor cheese, nor food cooked with oil. Even for Pascha, instead of eggs, they boiled potatoes and dyed them red. The Brotherhood of Haji Georgia celebrated spiritually during the holy days, and not with fine foods. The grace of God strengthened them physically, and they were very healthy. If once in a while a brother came down with a cold, the elder would warm up the furnace a bit, and after it cooled down he would test it with his hand. Then the brother with the cold crawled in and became well. If by chance someone came down with something else, he would put him in front of the icon stand and they would pray all night. They would supplicate the Panagia, and at the end of the Divine Liturgy, the sick brother would receive Holy Communion instead of medicines, and he became well. If it was an elder monk who was suffering toward the end of his life, then Christ would take him close to him in order to give him eternal rest. The Holy Elder had great boldness before God as did the fathers of his brotherhood, because they had become like angels. Of course, most of them were like little angels even from before they entered into the monastery. So how much more were they to become later with supernatural asceticism they practiced? They became spiritually detached from the material world and soared up to higher realms. Their minds, their noose, were always with God. He also had about a hundred other elderly disciples. They were in other cells around him because they had a difficult time adjusting to his strict rule. Nevertheless, he provided them with all that was necessary that they might be free of cares and be able to pray for their salvation and the salvation of the whole world. Most of these old disciples at the time were Russians. During his last years on Manathos, Three or four brothers who were used to a comfortable life and motivated by egotism became monks near Haji Georges so that they too would be considered in some way genuine children of Haji Georges. In fact, little by little, they influenced a few other brothers of the brotherhood as well as a scholar, the monk Theophan, Moldavian by birth. They complained to the holy monastery of the Lavra, so that Haji Georges would have to change his austere rule for the sake of these three or four who could not adapt. The Holy Elder was immediately obedient to the monastery, and from then on they consumed food with oil every weekend, and they also boiled vegetables. Once a large wild boar went into their garden and destroyed their vegetables, and the monks mentioned it to the Elder. He told them to watch out for it and to tell him when they saw it. So one evening, just as the beast was breaking down the fence to get in, they ran and told the elder. As soon as he saw it, Haji Georges, he made the sign of the cross over it. The beast froze on the spot. The Yeranda then grabbed it by the ear. The wild boar then followed him like a lamb to the stable, where, as a canona, he locked it in it for three hours without food. Footnote, the canon, the discipline imposed by the spiritual father upon the believing sinner in the context of the mystery of repentance towards correction. Such discipline could take the form of fasting, almsgiving, prayer, abstinence from divine communion for a specific time, and so forth. To continue, after three hours, he opened the stable. He set the boar free, told it, Blessed animal, 
Is it not enough that you have all of Athos to roam, and you come here to destroy these few vegetables with so many souls are waiting to be fed? Now go in peace. Do not come again, because then I will give you a double penance. Indeed, from then on it did not show up again. Naturally, this was not something exceptional for the mature spiritual state of the elder, since he had done so many other and greater things in his childhood, as well as when he was a novice. Indeed, another story similar to this one happened at Kafso Khalif as well. There, too, a wild boar entered their garden and did the damage. Father Neophytos sent Gabriel to catch it, tie it up with his belt, bring it in, and so he did. The elder then ordered that they should f feed it with roots and wild greens, and that they should prepare a manger for it in the stable. And he told the wild boar, Whenever you are hungry, come here, and the monks will feed you. And do not destroy the father's gardens here. The wild boar then became a boarder, and when it was, whenever it was hungry, it went to the cell for a meal. Another time the elder had left Kerasia with his disciple Abraham, gone high up on Athos for some wood they needed. When they had cut enough, he laid out the rope, piled up the wood, and told Father Abraham to carry it. He was perplexed because there was so much that even four animals would not be able to carry it, but he believed in the sanctity of his elder, and so he sat down in order to load it on his back. Haji Georges made the sign of the cross over the load, helped Abraham up on his feet. Later, Father Abraham would say, you would have thought that I had a light quilt on my back. The elder also had the gift of spiritual perception, that is to say, spiritual television. Often he would stop his work suddenly and go out into the road to approach people who were despairing, and he would console them and help them to be saved. In the face of Haji George's, people saw a divine radiance and easily opened up their suffering hearts and were healed. Everyone spoke with wonder and reverence about the elder. Greek and Slav, Athenite monks recognized him for his asceticism, and the sanctity which he dispersed and radiated on Athos. His advice was God-inspired and his hospitality was like that of Abraham. Thus his guests were nourished in two ways. He also had two spiritual fathers in his brotherhood to confess the pilgrims, Father Isaac and Father Anthony. The work of their hands was iconography. One of the exceptional iconographers was the most devout hero monk Minas. They did other work with their hands as well, without ceasing to pray noetically with unceasing prayer. The elder relieved fr from their duties those fathers whom he knew loved prostrations, the Matanyas, and prayer more than the others, and told them to make prostrations and to pray constantly for the whole world. For the holy elder who was also interested in the salvation of the souls of the entire world. He even tried to baptize Turks, as indeed he did by the grace of God. Among them was a chief of a division and a government minister, an Agas of the Holy Mountain, whom the elder baptized after much prayer and fasting because this minister was wavering. Despite the fact that the elder constantly practiced strict asceticism, he was nevertheless healthy and walked ever so lightly that you would think he was flying. His eyes were always open and bright. His face shone and had a sweet rosy color. His neck leaned forward with his head like a ripe ear of wheat. He was of medium stature, thin and composed only of bones and nerves because he sacrificed his flesh with asceticism out of Philotimo toward God. He rejoiced in vigils and was spiritually nourished by them. While all found rest in bed, Haji Georges found rest standing in his stasidi. His cell hardly ever saw him because at night he was in church, and during the day he was with the suffering people. His disciples did not tire him as they were spiritually mature, though young in age. With his gift of spiritual perception by merely casting a glance at his monks, even before they told him their thoughts, the elder would read their thoughts as well as their hearts. 
once the elder even foresaw an accident that was going to happen to the family of the czar. And he wrote to the czar that he would not pass over a certain bridge on a certain day with his family coach. When he read the elder's letter, the czar smiled and said, the monk is asking for alms, sent him a few rubles. Six months later, however, while in the coach with his family, the czar passed exactly that point, and on that day, which the elder had foretold, and the coach overturned. But no one was hurt, for they were all saved by a miracle. Then he remembered the prophetic words of Haji Georges and realized that he and his family had been saved by his prayers. From that time on, the czar held him in great reverence and would send his high-ranking officials to Haji Georges for advice. It was natural, however, that jealousies would arise among the various Russian monks and that the Russians went to Haji Georges, who was a Greek, and did not go to them for advice. Many Russians, however, who had been healed through his prayers, sent alms to the elder. But since he lived very ascetically with his brotherhood, he passed them on in great abundance as, as blessings, evlogia, to the other ascetics or to the poor. That is why they used to say, he gives like a Haji Georges, when someone gave alms to the poor generously with an open hand. The elder himself had only one cassock, one raso, with a soutane and a pair of pants, an undergarment. He always walked around barefoot and only in church wore some heavy socks. The good God, however, warmed him with his great love since his faithful servant struggled with Philotimo for the love of Christ. Otherwise, there is no human explanation how someone can live high up in Keresia where Athos becomes very cold while spending the winter wearing almost nothing and with very little frugal food. Whoever came to know the elder revered him as a saint which, of course, he was. Indeed, many devout Russian pilgrims took photographs of Haji Georges and brought them to the sick in Russia, who embraced them with faith and were healed. The photographs of Haji Georges were to be found in the icon corners of Russians, together with the icons of saints. The suffering called upon him in their prayers, and the Holy Elder helped them by the grace of God like the saints, while still in Caricia on Athos, However, all these miraculous signs, together with the reverence of the people and even of the Tsar himself toward Haji Georges, had created, as I mentioned already, great jealousy and envy among certain Russian Athenites. And for that reason, they slandered him to the Greeks, saying that Haji Georges supposedly loved Russia and the Tsar while they loved Greece. Unfortunately, there were certain suspicious Greeks who believed this because during that period, Human hatred was rampant because of Russian propaganda. However, the relationship of the Holy Yeronda to the Russians was, was purely spiritual. At the same time, there arose another temptation in the form of a great discord between the Greeks and the Russians. At the Holy Monastery of St. Pantolemon, they had invited Elder Haji Georges in order to reconcile them, and he prayed and traveled back and forth for two months. After that, he saw the Panagia in a vision, bestowing blessings equally to the Greeks and to the Russians. And the elder understood from this vision that Greeks, as well as Russians, must remain at the monastery of St. Pantolemon, and that they must love one another. But those who created the scandals on both sides at the monastery of St. Pantolemon not only did not obey the advice of the elder Haji Georges, which also was the wish of the Panagia, because peace and love were not in their interest, but they also agreed to get rid of him so that they could continue their dispute, and this is what happened. Well, the elder returned to Karasia, but even there he was continuously attacked by Russians and Greeks. The Russians were jealous because high-ranking officials from Russia came to Haji Georges, a Greek, and asked him for advice. So they slandered Haji Georges to the Greeks, saying that the elder was a Russophile, because the situation had become critical, certain suspicious Greeks believed this, as I already said, and dissolved Haji Georges' angelic brotherhood at Karasia. They left only the priest monk Minas, 
and three other monks, Gabriel, Vincent, and Simeon, all of whom were Greek at St. Demetrius. The elder fathers scattered to different parts of Manathos in groups, two or three. Three fathers of Haji George's brotherhood came here to the skeet of Kutlumisio. Father Abraham, Father Isaac, and Father George, who went to his native town of Rakova in northern Epirus, and brought two of his brothers, according to the flesh, to their brotherhood, Pericles, Father Luke, and Eurasimos, who became monks at the cells of St. Eurasimos. Later, Eurasimos Stogaius from the neighboring village of Plikatki, near Konitsa, also joined the brotherhood. He told me a great deal about the life of his spiritual grandfather, the elder Haji Georges. Further up from Keries, where Kapsala begins, at the Kili of St. George, the revealed, there lived six other monks of Haji Georges with their older spiritual brother as the Yeronda, the most venerable father Evlogios. In addition, two other monks came to the cell, the Kili of St. Theodorus, near the monastery of Kutlumasiu. Elder Haji Georges, however, was also responsible for the young monks. He went to the holy monastery of Grigoryu, where he had been tantrid a monk, and built a kili high up in the forest, dedicated to St. Stephen. There, he gathered all the young monks of his brotherhood as a good father and affectionate mother, and protected them. But, because there were many lay workers in the forests of Grigoryu, who were, who were loggers, the elder told the young monks not only to refrain from speaking to the lay workers, but also to avoid them. So when the young monks were performing their duties, their diaconimas in their area, and saw the lay workers, they would hide in the bushes, and they would say the Jesus prayer until they left. Unfortunately, however, there were certain people who again exploited this and started slandering the holy elder to the whole monastery of Grigoriu, saying, Haji Georges has many other monks hidden on the mountain who are not registered with the monastery, and he is keeping his plans secret. <laughs> Consequently, the monks of Grigoriu were tempted and drove the elder away from their area. He was then forced to stay with his disciple, Father Evlogios, at St. George. The revealed one, and later moved into the Russian cell of St. Stephen in Kapsala. Unfortunately, however, even there the people who were envious of him did not stop making up scandalous stories. Finally, they even convinced the holy community of the holy mountain to agree to the exile of Haji Georges. In other words, to expel him from the holy mountain. Quote, the holy community, through the resolution taken on October 27, 1882, in their 52nd council dissolving all previous decisions, has agreed to the request of the Holy Russian Monastery to expel the Greek Haji Georges from the Russian Kili of St. Stephen for failure to comply with the status quo of this our holy place. Therefore, Father George, the man of God, arrived at the place of his exile in Marmama of Constantinople, wounded and now separated from his spiritual children and from the garden of the Panagia, the holy mountain. While he flew like a royal eagle high over Athos, unfortunately, a few mischievous children, not from his brotherhood but strangers, continually clipped his wings and destroyed his nest until they compelled Haji Georges to leave. A cornerstone, wherever it may be thrown, is going to be used again as a cornerstone. He found a deserted monastery close to Constantinople in Marmama, that of St. Hermolias and St. Pantolemon, and there he continued his ascetic life once again. The presence of Haji Georges in Constantinople during this period was divine balsam for the souls of the suffering Christians, because they suffered greatly under the barbaric Sultan Abdul Hamid in 1883. The Holy Elder not only dispensed his divine comfort to suffering souls, but also healed ailing bodies through the grace of God which he had. He worked miracles. Even his belt was wonder-working. Sick people wore it and were healed.
women who were in danger during childbirth asked for the belt of the holy elder, and as soon as they put it on, they immediately delivered. And those possessed were released from demons. There in Mamara, he was visited by a disciple of his, Father Simeon, and the elder gave him a blessing to repair the ruined cells of St. Demetrios and St. Minas. This was consistent with the rule that Haji Georges followed, to give the blessings he received in the form of gifts, as blessings to others, while he himself remained poorer than the poor. In this way, however, he became rich spiritually, like a young nobleman, a child of God. Of course, he was helped in this by his asceticism, out of Philotimo, which he continued until his last year of his life, which was spent bedridden. His entire body was now in pain, especially his feet, and he was unable to walk. Although his bodily strength left him, he still did not abandon his asceticism, even while in his bed. Neither did the suffering people leave him alone, because there was great need, and the downcast flocked to him for help and spiritual advice. Even from his bed of pain, the holy elder showed concern for the pain of others. The elder was greatly supported by the hero monk Parthenios, a Russian, from Kerasia. He had been saved by Haji Georges from certain death, and later became his disciple and held the elder in great reverence. Yet the behavior of the Russian hero monk Parthenios greatly irritated the situation of Haji Georges's exile. This is because the hero monk Parthenios, he loved glory somewhat and sought recognition. Thus, he used the name of the blessed Haji Georges in all his activities, exploiting the holiness of the elder and thus creating problems. But on the other hand, he loved the elder and remained at his side to the end of his life. Up until the last moment of his life, the Holy Father had an enlightened mind and advised people with divine clarity. Among those who came to him for spiritual help toward the end of his life were people visiting him with financial needs because they thought that he would have a lot of money in the bank. Pointing to heaven with his hand from his bed, Haji Georges would say to them, There is my bank. Here I do not have money. I still have only one debt to pay. He meant that of surrendering his soul into the hands of God. Later he asked for and received Holy Communion, then fell asleep in the Lord on the 17th of December, 1886, Old Calendar. He was buried in Balukli, the church of the life-giving font of the Theotokos. In the same grave where his brother Anastasios had been buried three years earlier. During those days on the holy mountain, Father Neophytos, tonsured by Father Neophytos Karamanlis, was also bedridden. He was Haji Georges's spiritual brother, who lived in Katonakia, at the cell, the huts of the Dormition of the Theotokos. While Father Neophytos was in bed looking toward heaven, he suddenly felt that he left his body and lost his senses when he came to himself after a little while. He said, Just now I was in Constantinople at Haji George's. And what did you bring us from there? asked his disciple, Father Ignatius. Here, I brought you some koliva. And what did he tell you? Father Ignatius went on to ask. He told me, In three days I will come for you. He answered and then stopped talking. We, said Father Ignatius, did not pay any attention to the words of the elder. But to the surprise of his disciples and without being ill except for the exhaustion of old age, truly within three days, that is on the 20th of December 1886, Father Neophytos also surrendered his soul peacefully. While Haji Georges had left for the heavens on the 17th of December of 1886, precisely the day and the hour when Father Neophytos saw his vision. By order of His Holiness Patriarch Joachim III, an official funeral service was held by Bishop Vasarion of Darachion and all the clergy, and a moving funeral oration was delivered. A large crowd of laity accompanied the Holy Elder Haji Georges, among whom were children, boys and girls, students from school, 
whom the blessed elder greatly helped while he lived. Everyone felt the pain of the loss of their protector, even the Turks, because many of them also had benefited and had been healed from various illnesses, and they held him in reverence. Indeed, the Turks called Haji Georges Bizimbaba, that is, our father. Haji Georges had profuse, guileless love for everyone. He was always peaceful, long-suffering, and forgiving. He had a big heart with room for all. That is why everything and everyone fit in the way they were. He had somehow surpassed physical and material limitations. By living the angelic life, he became an angel, and he flew to the heavens because he did not hold on to anything, neither passions of the soul nor material things. He cast them all aside, and that is why he was able to soar to great heights. Because the holy Yerunda was tormented unjustly by people, I believe that he was deemed worthy of a double crown by Christ, that of a monastic saint and that of a martyr. When one is tormented by Christians, the pain is even more terrible because the people of God, they feel the pain of the cruel behavior of others more acutely, behavior which is not becoming of Christians. From the few things I mentioned above, one can readily understand the holiness of the Blessed Father George, Haji George. Naturally, the Holy Father tried to live in obscurity as the Holy Fathers of our church usually did, and that is why the little that I know and write, it does him an injustice. It is not important that our church still has not declared him a saint in order to give him a halo. That which is very important is the radiant life of the elder, his simple, guileless, silent example. He was full of virtues and divine power which he offered together with himself in order to help his fellow man. He also preached Christ from afar. He performed miracles, saw divine visions, and also had the gift of spiritual perception. He had an abundance of grace from God, which gave him away. When the exhumation of his holy relics took place, an indescribable fragrance exuded from them. The Huron monk Parthenios gave some of Haji Georges's relics as blessings to devout Russians, and the rest he kept in his Hilandari cell dedicated to the Annunciation of the Theotokos in Keryes. Pray that Haji Georges's relics be found in order that we too may obtain a blessing from his holy relics, since we did not live during his time so as to be blessed by him. Amin. Blessed and devout of God George, cast a compassionate glance on me too, the wretched Paisios, signed Action Estin, 11th of June, 1983, Kutlu Museu Keli Panahuda, Holy Mountain of Athos. Glory be to God. Letter of Haji Georges to the Metropolitan of Chios. The Holy Elder also had spiritual children in the world, which he helped and protected spiritually as we shall see from a letter he wrote to the Metropolitan of Chios. While the fathers lived in the world, they nevertheless lived outside the world, living the strict Haji Georgian Tipikon. Indeed, with their good example and fighting spirit, they helped the Christians preserve the holy traditions of our church. It seems that from that time on, people gradually began to slack off spiritually, and Haji Georges struggled to preserve the orthodox fighting spirit of our church, We must pay more attention to this in our times, because apart from the great laxity which is apparent, unfortunately people of today have reached such a point where they relax the rules, but impose them on those who struggle to apply them. That is why those who struggle should not only not be influenced by the worldly spirit, but also should not compare themselves with worldly people and think that they are saints, and later become lax and end up worse than most worldly people. However, when we compare ourselves to the saints, we will be able to see our passions. We will be humbled, and we will struggle with more philotimo, so that we will be saved. Amin. Letter of Haji Georges to the Metropolitan of Chios. To His All Holiness, the Metropolitan of Chios, the Lord Gregory reverently, 
Your All Holiness, Holy Bishop, I humbly kiss your holy right hand. I ask you and I assure you that the monks, the elder Herotheus and the elder Makarios, who live the Hezekistic life in a hut in on your sea, have loved and chosen the good part. May it be that they will hold on to such a life, for they took a vow by themselves in pride, but as of today, may it be with your blessing. Let them keep their rule of fasting, because whoever fasts as a sinner with humility or through asceticism or because of love for God is not prevented from doing so by the canons of our Holy Fathers. Indeed, we have witnesses from many places. Many saints spent their lives on wild greens, others on legumes, as did St. John Chrysostom. St. James, the brother of the Lord, he never broke the fast in all of his life, nor did he eat anything animate, nor did many of the anchorites. And now neither do I, the least of all men. We are up to uh, 30 brothers in one kili. I have been here 40 years, and we live this life in the same way, and neither on Pascha nor during, in general, a reference to the Apocryus. In general, this word refers to the last day on which meat consumption, great meat fare, is allowed before Great Lent begins. It's further identified with the first three weeks of the Triodian, which begins with the Sunday of the Publican and the Pharisee. To continue, nor during meat fare do we break the fast. Similarly, there are also a few ascetics who live in groups of two or three, and they live the hesychistic life, and these two spend their lives in fasting. When one fasts according to the canons, then he is bound by them. But it is said that for those who struggle, there are no restrictions, and he who struggles is always abstinent. May it now be done with the prayer and the blessing of your holiness, so that it does not trouble their consciences for being disobedient. A monk must always be a good example to the laity, so that the light may shine before men. Indeed, in being the shepherd that you are, it is now necessary to take great care and fight against those who fight fasting, because many of today's Christians have greatly fallen away, at times with threats, at times with admonition. You should teach them not to break the laws of the Holy Fathers and Holy Synods of the Church, because they write that whoever does not keep the Wednesday and Friday fasts Great Lent and other designated fasts should be excommunicated. That is why we should make it as difficult as we can for the people to break the laws of God and do improper things. You should prosecute such transgressors. Indeed, for the brothers who want to fast and have no bad intentions, do not stop them. But seeing that they struggle, you should rejoice that you have such virtuous men in your sea and be proud of them. Indeed, if a need should befall them once in a while, you should help them. I hope your reward will be great in caring for such men. Pay attention, my holy bishop, because we also have death before us. Judgment awaits us, and then God will judge each person, together with his peers. Forgive me, the least of all men, and my boldness, as I am not worthy to open my mouth to say a single word especially having heard of your good renown. May your holy prayers always be with us. Amin. Signed, Monk Haji Georges, Karasia, Mount Holy Manathos, 15th April, 1872. The Spiritual Forefathers of Haji Georges if we all have the sacred duty to remember and be grateful to our forefathers because we owe so much to them, how much more do we owe our saintly spiritual forefathers who help us with their boldness before Christ? For this reason, it would be good for me to mention a few words about the spiritual father of Haji Georges, Father Neophytos, and his spiritual grandfather, his papu, the elder Avzentios. When Father Neophytos Karman Lise was still a small child in Caesarea, he heard about the holy mountain, and with his childlike simplicity, he thought that the monastic hermits would eat only when they would hear a bell ring in heaven. So he decided to imitate them. 
He waited to hear a bell toll at the ninth hour, which he did hear, and then sat down and ate. He continued this ritual for a long time until he was 18 years old, when he came to the holy mountain and became a monk under Elder Avgazentios at Kafso Kalivia, and he struggled out of Philotimo for 88 years. His eminence, Porfirios Uspensky, who was still an Archimandrite at the time, had visited Father Neophytos and conversed with him. He then wrote the following, quote, Father Neophytos was born and raised in the East. For a long time he has been struggling here for the salvation of his soul as well as for others. He is a spiritual father, and the monks of five monasteries and the bishops who live on the holy mountain confess to him. According to what he says, the monks of the Cenobitic monasteries frequently commune the holy mysteries, but without strict fasting. Father Neophytos is not comfortable with that spirit. He is strict. It made an impression on me. When I read from St. John Chrysostom that those who receive the body and blood of Christ should be more pure than the rays of the sun, and I asked him to tell me something for my benefit. He looked at me with his discerning eyes and he told me, Have fear of God and be abstinent. Amin, I answered him, and then went on to ask him about their life. I have ten disciples, he told me. They do not go anywhere. During the day they cultivate the garden and the vineyard, and at night they individually do many prostrations. And among them, he who loves prostrations more than the others is relieved from work. Living on dried food is sufficient for them. They receive Holy Communion once a week after confessing their thoughts and the prayer of absolution. And the elder and spiritual father Neophytos, according to the judgment of his contemporaries, was a holy man before God. He foresaw and knew the day of his death 40 days beforehand. He read the Holy Gospel in the Psalter, dug his own grave, he received the Holy Mysteries, gave his blessing to his disciples, crossed himself, and in peace gave his soul to the Lord. He fell asleep in 1860 at the age of 106, 88 of which he lived on Athos. Regarding the spiritual grandfather of Haji Georges the Elder, Avzentios, Father Germanos, Father Herman Hare mentioned the following, quote, in the old days, at the skeet of Castle Caliv, there were venerable elders, like the ancient great fathers, before whom we, the elders said, and all the brotherhood of the skeet would pass with great reverence and awe. They stood as unshakable pillars at all-night vigils from the evening until the morning, looking down on the tiles of the church. The church was full of such elders. They were all quiet, idle talk, did not exist among them. Even when necessary, they spoke little, and only when the time was right, when it was proper, they safeguarded their spiritual life with precision. Of these, the elder monk Avzentios especially shone with his radiant life. Among all those elder warriors, he was like a star. He lived in the Kili of the great martyr St. George. He had a clay pot where he boiled wild greens, for himself, which he gathered in the wilderness, and he was nourished only by these. Once in a while he would also eat bread, but nothing more. The elder Axentios lived many years, about sixty, at the skeet. After his death, his disciple Neophytos Carmanalis remained, who died in 1860, at over one hundred years of age. Thus after Father Neophytos Carmanalis, his disciple, Haji Georges shone at Kerasion Athos as a morning star, a great ascetic and strict faster who developed a great reputation. His name became an epithet for all those who fast much. He is a Haji Georges. May we have his holy prayers. Amin. Spiritual Laws Since some people might have the question, why does God allow righteous men, such as the man of God, Haji Georges, even though he was a very pure soul from the time of his childhood, to be tormented with trials, slanderings, etc.? 
I thought it good to write my feelings on this. Of course, the judgments of God are an abyss, but one of the many reasons may be the following according to my thinking. If God did not also allow certain righteous men to be slandered, how could some who are guilty but could not acknowledge their fault out of egotism be covered? Indeed, the earth does not have room for them, and the demons ask for a chance to bring them to despair, do harm to themselves, so that they will be condemned. However, the great love of God allows the righteous to be unjustly accused and slandered in order that a weak soul might not be lost, but in the end the truth is revealed. In this way we too are helped to always have good thoughts regarding whatever bad things are spread about our neighbor, and to wonder, maybe it's just slander. Naturally, then, even the guilty are consoled, and little by little they begin to feel their guilt. Their consciences begin to bother them, and they correct themselves, if they have a good disposition. In short, at times, God lightens the burden of the guilty by allowing the strong and righteous to be slandered. Naturally, the unjustly treated are the most beloved of God's children. However, according to my thinking, they themselves do not see things this way. On the contrary, they see themselves as guilty, and if the grace of God were to abandon them, they would even be in prison as guilty, and their consciences would torment them. They would be overcome with remorse. Although unjustly treated, they have in their hearts the unjustly treated Christ, and rejoice in exile and in prison as if they were in paradise, because wherever Christ is, there is paradise. Thus the righteous, with their noble love, do not aspire to a heavenly reward due to the good deeds they do for their fellow man, because they are children of God, and they work with Philotimo in their own house, which is the church of Christ. If man closely examine the benefit to the soul and the internal exaltation which he feels even in this life by a small act of kindness to his neighbor, he would beg him to accept it and would even be grateful to him. For the transformation that the soul undergoes and the joy which the heart of a compassionate man feels, even from offering a slice of bread to an orphan, could not be offered him by the greatest cardiologist, even if he paid him a sack full of dollars. Such is the exaltation which is felt by the souls of struggling Christians who keep vigil, pray, and fast, and which cannot be understood by those who eat whatever they want, whenever they want, and drink wine and refreshments. Naturally, as I mentioned, the children of God do not work either for a heavenly reward or for the spiritual joys of this life, because children are not paid by their father, since all of their father's wealth already belongs to them. It is quite another thing to consider what divine gifts God will offer us as a good father in this life and in eternity. Of course, those who work for reward are laborers, and those who avoid sin so as not to be condemned, again, are looking after their own interests. Indeed, that is good, but there is no nobility in it, because in the face of the great sacrifice which Christ made in order to redeem us, out of Philotimo we ought not to go to hell so as not to grieve him through his sensing that we are suffering. This is the kind of love that the Holy Fathers of our Church had for Christ. But, unfortunately, many of us have only an inferior love that only goes far enough so as not to be punished. Love of this kind goes hand in hand with lack of faith. In other words, we enjoy the things of this world to a degree just enough so as not to be punished in this life, but also not to be deprived of paradise. If Christ were to tell us, My children, paradise is now full, and I have no place for you, some of us would shamelessly say to Christ, And why didn't you tell us this before? Others would run so as not to lose time at all to take advantage even of one minute to enjoy themselves, and would not even want to hear about Christ. However, the children of God who have Philotimo would reverently say to Christ, don't worry at all about us. It is enough that paradise has filled. This gives us such great joy. It is as if we too are in paradise. 
and they would continue their spiritual struggles joyously with Philotimo as before him whom they had loved with pure love. And Christ, who is all love, would dwell in their pure hearts as he dwelled in the holy body of the pure virgin. Cases such as that of Haji Georges are naturally very few where God allows righteous and strong men to suffer, and to bear the burden of the weak and guilty, and in this way to help their fellow man. In cases such as these, precisely, we can say, according to God's providence, and not as in other cases when we give up to temptation, because then we retreat to the benefit of the evil one. In other words, it is then that spiritual laws operate. For every one that exalteth himself shall be humbled. Luke 18.14 Indeed, this is the way spiritual laws operate, according to my thinking. The higher we throw an object, the greater the force with which it is drawn down by the gravity of the earth, and is shattered. Law of physics. As much as one is exalted, so too will be his spiritual fall, and according to the magnitude of his pride, he will be shattered, unless his pride surpasses that of humans and reaches that of the demons. Then he is no longer within the grasp of spiritual laws of this life, but rather that of the apostolic one. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Second Timothy 3.13 However, when a man immediately perceives the lifting up of his pride and humbly asks for forgiveness of God, the merciful hands of God immediately pick him up with joy and bring him gently down without his descent being perceptible. And so he is not shattered since he has already been crushed in his heart beforehand by his repentance. Indeed, the same thing occurs also in the case of someone who has stabbed someone else. When he repents sincerely and with contrition, the good God does not allow retribution in this life by stabbing, since the heart of such a man in repentance is being stabbed anyway by his conscience, which goads him and he suffers. Then God, as loving Father, instead of a knife, gives the balsam of his divine consolation to his distressed heart. If, however, out of great Philotimo, the, the man himself who erred, persistently asks God to be punished in this life for his mistake, even though God has forgiven him and has been delivered from spiritual laws, then God grants his disinterested Philotimo petition, but also prepares an incorruptible heavenly crown for him. Also, whoever observes the commandments of God and asks as a favor from God that he be punished for the fault of his fellow man or that he take on the illness of his fellow man is very much akin to Christ, and Christ then is very touched by such noble love in his child. In fact, besides God doing him the favor of remitting the faults of others, he also allows him to undergo trials in his life according to his persistent petition. At the same time, God also prepares the diamond crown of martyrdom for him, because many people condemn such a man due to their judgment according to appearances, thinking that God punishes him for his sins, while actually he had become a spiritual lightning rod of pure gold due to his love for others and had thus become an imitator of Christ. In God's unfathomable judgment, we even see cases which we observe in prophets and saints, as also in numerous other cases. But most importantly, we see that even God changes when people change. Therefore, spiritual laws, they differ from physical laws, in that spiritual laws show mercy as man deals with his creator, the most compassionate God. That is to say, when a poorly behaved child comes to his senses, repents, and is smitten by his conscience, his father then caresses him with love and consoles him. The father teaches his children out of love with the goal of their coming to their senses and their coming close to him. He does not chastise out of evil, neither due to worldly legalistic justice, but rather from divine goodness, always for the good of all his children, so that they may be saved and thus inherit his heavenly kingdom. Thus may the good God act as God and not consider our nagging. Let it suffice that the whole world be saved. Amen. Epilogue 
May the good God give rest also to all the souls of the devout elders who preserved in their most pure memories many facts about the ascetic life of the Blessed Father who, when they mentioned the name of Haji Georges, were moved to tears. May God give rest as well to all the souls of the devout Greek pilgrims and the Russians who also kept notes on their Blessed Fathers, athletes of Christ, who fought the good fight with Philotimo in the Garden of the Panagia, and who published their spiritually heroic feats for the benefit of the faithful in their Christian writings. May Christ also reward all those devout people who helped much or little in their own way, such as Father Anthony of Kurulia, and others who gave me many facts in Russian, which were translated with great diligence by Deacon Philotheus from the Holy Monastery of Grigoriu, and Mr. John Tarnanidis with his assistant, Mr. Apostolos Kurulius. May he also reward the sisters at the Monastery of the Evangelist John and Soroti who corrected my spelling errors time and time again. I ask forgiveness of all devout readers for all the imperfections of my book. Pray that with the intercessions of the Blessed George I may correct my spiritual spelling errors so that I may be saved. Amin. Naturally, I did not intend to publish this brief life, but simply to put all the material which I had collected in good order into a notebook for those who would come after me. This is because it is somewhat shameful to write, since I am illiterate. However, the 100th anniversary of the falling asleep of the devout and blessed father, it pressured me constantly. And so I was compelled to put it into circulation in 1986 which is also the centennial year of Blessed George, Haji George's repose. May we have his holy prayers. Amin. Oh, oh.